Hey everyone. Um, I'm here with Eastra Health uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about women's health and psychedelics. Um, so first I'm gonna start with some intros um, to, to these very impressive people. So Pamela Hatfield and Jeremy Wheat are founders of Eastra Health. Eastra is the world's first female focused biotech company dedicated to developing psychedelic drive medicine specifically for women. So Eastra addresses women's under addressed health challenges from premenstrual syndrome to menopause through an innovative approach to drug discovery and a deep and holistic understanding of women's health, biology and needs. Pamela is passionate about the cross section of psychedelics, femtech and the advancement of women's healthcare. She believes that psychedelics are the biggest healthcare disruptor of our generation. And I agree with that. Um, she is also co-founder of HelloMD, the first telehealth and educational platform for health and wellness cannabis consumers. HelloMD has seen hundreds of thousands of patients via virtual consultations and is operational across North America. Uh, Pamela has been featured on the cover of Dope Magazine, In the New York Times, Rolling Stone, Forbes, Now This, Elle Magazine, TechCrunch, and many others. Outside of work, Pamela enjoys yoga, backcountry hiking, and spending time with her three girls. Jeremy is passionate about scaling psychedelic medicines to ensure they ac are accessible to as many people who need them. He's been seriously interested in psychedelic drug development as a key aspect of revolutionizing mainstream psychiatry, which led him to become CEO of a Vancouver-based Universal Ibogaine. He's also a big believer in flow states and hopes that his collective experience in psychedelics, healthcare, and business will help make significant advances in women's healthcare. Jeremy has spent the past 20 years leading teams in often complex and politically sensitive contexts around the world, ad advising governments in the mining sector. Outside of work, he falls into flow, riding his motorbike in the, in the peak district of, or playing fe fetch with two dogs. Um, okay, so let's start with a question. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, um, so women's healthcare is an interesting topic and it's, you know, even outside of psychedelics, it's, there's so much going on and so much that needs to be done. Um, a couple of years ago, the term women's healthcare gaslighting went mainstream. Um, can, can you explain to me what's going on in women's healthcare and what that means? Sure. And hi, Hannah. It's so nice to see you and thank you for hosting this. Yeah. Um, yeah. So for a long time, women have just simply been overlooked in healthcare. Um, and, you know, whether that's a doctor saying it's in your head or being excluded from clinical trials, women's healthcare needs have just simply been under addressed or even diminished within the modern healthcare system. Um, so when it comes to drug discovery and research, um, there's also a tradition of ignoring um, you know, gender when it comes to the health research. So it's not actually a tall tale. It's actually what's happened. And there's this enormous gap when it comes to drug development between men and women. And historically, women have been excluded um, from toxicology or even biomedical research. Um, so there have been inad inadequate numbers of women within research and clinical trials. And also when, when the results come out from these trials, the results are actually not being separated by gender. And this actually matters because men and women are biologically different. Um, so we see this playing out in, in real life all the time as women suffer disproportionately from chronic pain, from fibromyalgia, migraines, Alzheimer's, um, even cardiovascular disease. Um, so many of the clinical trials for these conditions, um, you know, when it, when it comes to the actual sub subjects in the clinical trials, the majority are often male. Um, and so then you have the research results that aren't separated by sex. And so it's just the equation is not really working out. Um, so my background at HelloMD, I saw this play out as we saw hundreds of thousands of patients. I saw that disproportionate number of women coming through who were suffering, who had gone through the, the traditional medical system and ended up trying cannabis. And, and as I, I like to say, they, they tried it and it was the medication of last resort and it should have been the medication of first resort. Um, so, you know, the data points are there. Um, and the reality is that, that women need better solutions. They need products designed specifically for them. Um, and yeah, do you have something to add with, to that, Hannah? Because I know that you, you know women in healthcare very well. Yeah, I mean, I think what comes to mind is just the, um, you know, the, the different reasons why, why women might experience um, uh, physical or uh, mental health 
um, issues more than men. And I think that, you know, I, I think as we were talking about before, there's a, a physiologic difference potentially with hormones that might cause different um, levels of mood disorders. There's the um, ignoring of uh, complaints when people go into the hospital. There's been a lot of studies about that, that like women go in with chest pain and they're, you know, they, they get sent to the psych ward. Um, and, uh, and then there's also the, like the emotional context. And uh, I've done a lot of work in, in the area of microaggressions and, and post-traumatic stress. And um, for me, I have a strong interest in neurodiversity, like ADHD and dyslexia, but there's, um, you know, strong research about how women experience microaggressions uh, through life and sort of dismissing needs. Um, and that can lead to like an environmentally caused mood disorder. So I think it's really important that, you know, there's these different aspects that we're looking at and, and keeping in mind, like why there might be different um, issues that are, are popping up for the population. Yeah. And it's certainly complex and multifaceted. So, yeah. Jeremy, anything to add there? Yeah. Um, you know, in the six months I've been working um, on the Easter Health Project, it's been a real eye opener for me to find out, you know, I knew that women had a raw, raw deal in medicine and in, in healthcare, but, um, you know, to, to see how absolutely bad and terrible it was, and then to put that into a historical context of, you know, a, a patronizing paternalistic bias against women, you know, the kind of Freudian hysteria model that we're still living under the shadow of. And, you know, this book, which I'm reading at the moment, Unwell Women by Eleanor Cleghorn, basically sums up the whole history. It's a, you know, a comprehensive account of, of what we've just been talking about. So I recommend people read it. Yeah, totally awesome. Um, so I guess this will lead into my next question. And um, it's why are why psychedelics and women's health care and why now? Why are we talking about psychedelics now? That's a great question, Hannah, and one I like to talk about, obviously. <laughs> Um, so going back to, to being involved with HelloMD and seeing hundreds of thousands of patients come through, it was probably about three years ago that a lot of women, and it was vastly, the vast majority were women, started to ask me questions directly, DM me about psychedelics. Uh, and I thought this was really interesting because it was a very sudden shift from, from fielding a lot of questions about cannabis to now fielding a lot of questions about psychedelics. And the questions were, you know, how do I help my depression? How do I help my pain? How do I stop PTSD? How do I, um, you know, find MDMA, psilocybin, so on and so forth. And I was woefully inadequately um, capable of responding to any of these questions because I, I wasn't educated. And so I started to, to look into the science and the research um, that was going on about or with psychedelics at the time. And that's when I realized, wow, this really is a huge healthcare disruptor, if not one of the biggest healthcare disruptors of our generation. And so uh, it was really the women that led me down this path. I didn't just find psychedelics um, because so many people were so interested and the science and the research is bearing out. And, and it's my belief that we're just at the tip of this iceberg, right? We're looking at PTSD and severe intractable depression, addiction, but there is so much more that psychedelics have to offer. Um, and in terms of women's healthcare, my belief and our belief is that within Easter Health, we have the ability to create psychedelic derived medicines to actually um, look at these under addressed healthcare challenges that women go through throughout the span of their lifetime. Amazing. Yeah. And, um, and, Jeremy. You know, uh, yeah, sorry, I'd, I'd add to that, that you know, that um, <clears throat> when, when Pamela came to myself and uh, co founder Mitchell, um, and she had this idea of just the basic framing of women in psychedelics. It, it you know, a, a volcano exploded in my head basically because, you know, I've been following psychedelics for many years and going to lots of conferences. And, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the molecules and molecule development, and that's all, all very nice. But, you know, the, my interest is not in actually the science. It's that, you know, that's a means to an end, which is healing people, making people feel better and all the rest of it. So taking the frame of women and psychedelics, I thought, yeah, that's exactly right. Because, you know, what we're about at Easter Health is, is like women, you know, the patient centric perspective, understanding mood disorders um, in women, first of all, in all the depth that science can afford, and then going to the molecules and, and working out, you know, what works and what doesn't work. 
Yeah, awesome. And, I, and you know, I think it's really important to um, like your approach that is starting with women and going from there, I think is, is so important um, rather than like, you know, making it an afterthought, which I think is what often happens um, later on. It's like, oh, maybe this could have helped this group and then trying to separate it out in the, the numbers. I think it's really important to start there and then and then take it where it needs to go. Um, and I definitely agree that the psychedelic movement is the future of everything. And I, I feel like every other day I'm like, I got to drop everything. This is the most amazing thing ever. And I'm like, oh, I already did four years ago. I dropped everything. So I, I really do believe it. Um, you know, it will revolutionize mental health care and health care in general. And I think starting from the right place and starting with specific populations is really important. So I congratulate you on that. Um, Thank you. So um, my um, last question is, is there, um, is there science to back up this premise that psychedelic drive medicine may be effective for women's mood disorders? What's yeah, the science? I'll, I'll take this one. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so the first point to make here is that um, there's been a huge blind spot with psychedelic research thus far, to my knowledge, which is that we really haven't taken a, you know, a sex differentiated approach to the data. So that we, you know, psilocybin or LSD or now DMT studies have not really looked and addressed at like poten potential sex differences, you know, hormonal differences, which, which is a little bit strange when you think about it, because, um, you know, the hormonal influence, um, you know, which is the main driver to sex difference can make a huge impact on, you know, kind of emotional and psychic landscapes. Um, and, and beyond sex differences, looking at age differences or maybe looking at racial differences, none of this is actually factored into psychedelic research so far. So it really needs to start to happen. Um, if you start with the target indication, in this case, you know, the continuum from, you know, reproductive age, PMS and the acute form PMDD, all the way through to perimenopause, menopause and beyond, You'll see that the story is about fluctuating, uh, fluctuating is, is estrogen and, in particular, estradiol levels. Um, and in the case of PMS and uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, basically what's happening is, around the time of ov ovulation each month, there's a, a significant drop in estradiol level, estradiol level levels, and that has um, a direct knock-on impact into the serotonergic system, in specific cases. So why does PMS, why do women suffer more from PMS and PMDD um, than other women? It's definitely complicated. It's not just a simple, you know, molecular interaction. Um, stress is involved. There's definitely a genetic aspect of this, a hereditary aspect, um, you know, diet, lifestyle, and all the rest of it. But at the core of it, from a biological perspective, is this knock-on effect of low estradiol levels in this complex multifactorial environment leading to you know dysregulation of the serotonin system so there you have like that intimate linking and then you, you you look at psychedelics and you think well you know classic psychedelics are intrinsically serotonergic you know they they impact and activate the serotonin system in the case of classic psychedelics like psilocybin and lsd you know they're agonizing and activating the serotonin serotonin a receptor so you see okay so there's there's something there like as a basic hypothesis where we're headed with our research, though, is to take a particular molecule, in this case 2CB, which is very well known for its uh, intactogenic and its sympathogenic relational qualities. And uh, in the case of w uh, women, we know that women typically um, experience 2CB differently to men. For men, it's often more of a stimulant or more of an amphetamine type effect. And for women, it can often be pretty cathartic, uh, emotional, and also embodied like an embodied kind of uh, ameliorative response. And so we figure, you know, in that, that's our basic hypothesis that if you, if you take a molecule at low doses um, that has this empathogenic response, then it can basically lift mood states, you know, along at the reproductive age. And, you know, towards the end of the reproductive age, it also can potentially lift mood states. Amazing. Pamela, anything to add? No, I'd, I'd just be curious about your, your insights um, because you've been in this for so long, Anna. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think I would just add that, um, you know, there is, there's, uh, again, the physiologic aspect, but there's the um, environmental aspect. And I, I would say when women go through menopause, that is also coincides with the time that society is like, basically, we're done with you. <laughs> so I think like, just being aware that there is um, this uh, relational aspect and societal aspect and, um, you know, potentially these 
uh, molecules can help you know bridge these different times in life and um, different uh, emotional um, issues that go along with those times in life but that uh, you know as we've seen with MDMA and other psychedelics that if you pair some of these uh, molecules and uh, medicines with psychotherapy or with relational components they can be like synergistic together and I think you know, continuing to look into that if that is um, if that may benefit women at, at these different stages along with the psychedelics would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the hope and the promise, right? <laughs> totally. Well, I'm very excited for what you guys come up with and um, and stay tuned, I guess, right? Yeah, well, thank you so much for hosting this, Hannah. It's been such a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.